it's great to be here tonight, and um, thank you so much to the CPS and the Knights of the Hunting Club for inviting me. Um, some very familiar faces in the room, including my first tutor from the LSE, um, and some colleagues from there who worked in the House of Commons, and uh, many familiar supporters from the Taxpayers Alliance and various campaigns I've run, and some new friends as well. So thank you so much for having me. Um, I think it's worth saying how much um, I've learned from the Centre for Policy Studies over the past 12 years since founding the Taxpayers Alliance. Um, some of the work we did on Quangos, for example, was inspired by the excellent work on Quangos done by the CPS by Dan Lewis. And also on the European front, the work that um, Ruth leaded uh, with setting up Global Vision. Uh, and also Norman Blackwell, who of course is now on the leading lights on the perhaps more Eurosceptic side of this debate, from his position as Chairman of Lloyd's, um, has also been a great inspiration. So it's a great privilege to be um, here tonight. In less than two years, the British people will face a decision about our future in the European Union. A decision on which depends our economy, our prosperity, and the very character of our nation. Do we stay in at all costs, which is the CBI's position? Or do we leave at all costs, which is the goodbye position? Or do we follow the evidence and say that on balance, in the absence of change, it's time to vote leave? To make that decision, we need a sober analysis of where Britain stands in the world. What are our strengths and what are our weaknesses? Do the solutions of the 20th century still work for the problems of the 21st? To Europe, of course, we've been known for many things over the centuries. Uh, Napoleon's nation of shopkeepers, the whole home of empiricism, a powerhouse of ideas exporting enlightenment across the continent, the birthplace of Adam Smith, and the Wealth of Nations, prizing back to both theory, the starter over the state. And it is those shopkeepers and startups who've noticed that one crucial fact over the past four decades, they've had an enlightenment of their own. For the hairdressers and the cafe owners, the pub landlords and the retailers, the EU isn't contributing to the wealth of the nation. Rather, it's making life much more difficult for them. For too long, the argument has been dominated by the lobbyists of big business, big government, and the big banks. A corporatist web of influence shutting out the voices of the silent majority. Yet, it is the entrepreneurs at the sharp end who know the facts best, who see the job-killing effect of regulation at home and the changing landscape abroad. And that's why I founded Business of Britain, and I'm now proud, proud to be the Chief Executive of the Vote Leave campaign. Business leaders across the country know that the world is no longer divided between the West and the rest. Europe's 500 years of fame are coming to an end. With falling tariffs and a new age of globalisation, the common market can now stretch from Shanghai to Chicago from Delhi to Dundee. My argument today is based on one simple truth, that Britain can no longer do business inside the current EU. The status quo is not an option. And the choice before us is simple, change or go. Look to the future or the past. In this event, I believe we need to address three things. The first is the reality about the EU's economic decline. The urgent case for a fundamental renegotiation, well beyond what is currently being considered by the government. And the potential for renewal if we choose a British future in British hands. Those are the three things I want to talk about tonight. The reality, the renegotiation, and the renewal. The reality today is that the European Union is in crisis. The building constructed without an exit now has a bonfire 
in the basement. This is a long way from the predictions of the Euro elite. If you remember Roman Rudd's triumphant words that the Euro had defied the doomsayers, or Peter Mandelson's warning that keeping the pound meant economic isolation in Britain, or Tony Blair's insistence that staying out would be a betrayal of our national interest. Perhaps the wooden spoon should be reserved for the Financial Times, who insisted that Greece's admission to the Eurozone offered the prospect of long-term economic stability. But this isn't an I told you so speech. It's a where do we go now speech. We need an unflinching <coughs> look at the reality of the European Union. Because despite the crisis of recent years, Despite the sight of Greek pensioners crying in the streets, there are still those who insist that the EU as a whole is an economic power of tomorrow. For a long time, the EU's economic decline could be covered up. There were the protectionist measures, a flood of money to the periphery, the appearance of health and wealth. Then came 2008, as Warren Buffett memorably said after the financial crisis, it's only after the tide goes out that you can see who's swimming naked. Well, uh, Jean-Claude Juncker and co were caught swimming naked, but it wasn't a pretty sight. What was revealed was a bureaucratic mess, a total lack of structural reform. The hard facts are these. In 1973, the EU accounted for 70, sorry, 37% of world GDP. By 2025, it will account for just 20% of world GDP. The EU is now the world's capital of welfare, with 7% of the world's population, 25% of global GDP, and 50% of social spending. Why is this? Because while others power ahead with trade deals, the EU is lost in a maze of endless symmetry, an emblem of entropy, not enterprise. Britain used to be the sick man of Europe, and now the EU is the sick man of the world. And quite literally, because the demographics aren't on Europe's side. By 2020, the ratio of working age people to pensioners will be three to one. By 2050, it will be two to one. It all adds up to what the Prime Minister has called the competitiveness challenge. The old superpowers are clinging on to a place for top table. And if things don't change, they'll soon be serving the drinks. That's the reality of Brussels. <coughs> the reality in Britain is that this takes a severe toll on thousands of businesses. They say having a single market of um, half a billion customers on our doorstep is great for exporters. But exporters make up just 5% of British businesses. 95% of businesses don't trade overseas. Restaurant owners, builders, IT technicians, they don't care about free, free trade with Estonia. They get none of the benefit, but all of the burden. In the past five years, the EU has introduced 3,500 new laws affecting British businesses, 13 million words, 20 times the length of the Bible. Just to keep on top of this, a business person would have to read for an hour every single week of the year. When it comes to the big multinationals, they can absorb these costs. They have the armies of HR teams and regulatory specialists. But what about the smaller businesses that don't? As for the taxpayer, our net contribution has risen over 200% in the past decade. And the danger of EU membership, as it currently stands, is not just in what it costs us, but in what, it's also, in what also we lose. Locked out of trade with the faster growing parts of the world. Shackled to a behemoth. This is the reality of Brussels and Britain. And the reality is that those at the top of the EU still don't get it. Their goal remains integration. Their obsession with ever closer union 
is not so much an ode to joy as an order to it. Against that federalising juggernaut, Britain is almost powerless. When the UK joined the EU, we had 20% of the votes. Today, we have less than 10%. The UK has tried to block proposals from the Commission coming through the Council no less than 55 times. And how many times have we succeeded? Not once. Not so much up yours to laws as all yours to laws. And speaking of that arch federalist, even he now thinks that Britain is getting a rough deal and should not have to accept greater political integration. So everyone agrees that the EU needs to change. That's the reality of the situation. But what about the renegotiation? Now, my position is clear. Were the EU to agree to a fundamental renegotiation of its membership, I'd be willing to vote to remain in the EU. But unfortunately, that does not seem to be on the table. David Cameron set out his ambitions in his Bloomberg speech two years ago. Powers going back to the member states. Real democratic accountability. A much more competitive EU. And the seminal thousand page change or go publication, in which I was involved in writing, we set out the clear changes that were needed to actually achieve uh, those aims and objectives. When it comes to democratic accountability, that must mean British people electing British politicians who get the final say on laws affecting Britain. UK law must be supreme over the EU law, and anything else other than that is an affront to British democracy. When it comes to competitiveness, a fundamental renegotiation would be radical cuts to the red tape or SMEs in startups, a presumption that there is no EU regulation applied to them whatsoever if companies don't trade with the EU. There's simply no need for children's nurseries or pubs <coughs> to apply with the latest directives or Brussels. We also need greater protection in the financial sector too. George Osborne's valiant attempts to block the financial transactions tax and the bonus cap have both failed. Can you imagine um, such a specific hit on German manufacturing or French tourism being allowed? We must be able to opt out from these things. What's more, where the city is currently protected by the double majority vote for non Eurozone countries, we need to make sure this is a double, triple, quadruple lock, or the British economy will suffer badly. We need the ability to negotiate our own trade deals. When George Osborne goes to China, he needs the power to come back with a UK China free trade deal just like the one that Iceland and Switzerland have. Real reform would be the fast-tracking of EU trade deals as well. It took over five years to do a deal with Canada. The deals with the United States and India are stuck in treacle. A Chinese trade agreement has not even started yet. Meanwhile, the rest of the world powers ahead, tearing down these trade barriers. The EU urgency needs to speed up. And then we come to reform of the EU budget. It just carries on growing year on year, um, like some metastasizing seeds. The EU's camps haven't been given a clean bill of health for 19 years. They've been spending taxpayers' money on Tiffany jewellery and a fitness centre for dogs. I'm not making those two examples up. And a fundamental renegotiation isn't complete without a radical cut of the EU budget. The UK government bravely has led the way on transparency, putting spending online for taxpayers across the country to see. And the EU should follow suit. The secret deals of pork barrier must stop. If sunlight is the best disinfectant, then the offices of Brussels need to open the blinds. And we need to return the control of migration. That's a must. This is a red line for the sun, for voters and the right thing to do. Added together, these changes will mean power back in British hands, a more competitive EU, a new relationship with the EU is based squarely on trade, not on political union. Getting these things will be tough. A few nods and handshakes in the corridors of Brussels won't do it. 
and dressing up any superficial changes with a new label of associate status also wouldn't do either. What we clearly need is full-on treaty change. And the moment to push that change, if we're going to do it, is right now. As JFK once remarked, uh, the Chinese word for crisis is composed of two characters. One meaning crisis, the other meaning opportunity. It's if something fractures, so then you have the best chance to begin again. So it is with the EU today. The Eurozone has reached a point where it must either pull together or support weaker members or pull apart, integrate completely or disintegrate. And either course requires pitch change. And this crisis for the Eurozone and the EU presents that opportunity for the UK. And we could have forced them to accept the red lines which I outlined before. Or we can get out now before the burning building comes crashing down on us. Because there is another option on the table. Unless we regain the powers to negotiate trade deals, reclaim control over our borders, and reinstate the supremacy of UK law, we can, and we should, vote deep. As David Cameron himself has said, if our concerns fall on deaf ears and we cannot put our relationship with the EU on a better footing, then we should rule nothing out. We're told that if Britain was to leave the EU today, the, the sky would fall in. Um, pretty much like they said, the sky would fall in if we didn't join the Euro. Then, as now, we need to state the facts in a sensible and rational way. Because in this scaremongering queue, there is a deep underestimation of British strength. Like a long and bad relationship where one partner has lost its self-esteem and forgotten what they have to offer on their own. So part of my job of only is slaying these myths about Brexit. The myth that no one will do business with us. But almost three quarters of US investors want Britain to have a looser relationship with the EU. And 66% of the Asian investors agree with them. The myth, that, the myth that trade will take a catastrophic hit, that the UK will start to slow and set a decline into oblivion, is wrong. Again, look at the facts. We're the fifth largest economy in the world. We're one of the top ten trading nations in the world. While our EU trade deficit is getting worse, we have a growing trade surplus with the rest of the world. Then the most potent myth of all, that jobs will disappear. But the UK is the EU's single largest export market. In one year alone, Germany exported 16 billion euros worth of cars to the UK. France <coughs> exported 1.3 billion pounds worth of wine, euros worth of wine. 280 billion euros worth of trade in total across the EU. Why would anyone in this picture have an appetite for a trade war with the UK? For the EU to sub the UK would be economic, economic masochism. And then there are all those British strengths that are unique to our country. We're the home of the world's language, the heart of the Anglosphere, the centre of the Commonwealth. We're the world's leading financial centre, winning the global league in the soccer cup. James Bond, the Premier League, British fashion and music. Unlike the EU, Britain doesn't have to spend 39 billion euros a year on self-promotion. This is a huge potential which has yet to be realised fully. Britain already has 2,000 civil servants working on trade matters alone. And even if we don't have the right code to do trade deals, these people could be put to work on the trade deals we need. The idea that small countries can't close trade deals on their own is a complete myth. Look at Switzerland. Switzerland is free to pursue deals with Japan, Canada, China and India. They have the trade deals that we desperately need. Look at Hong Kong and Singapore, named as the two most open and competitive economies in the world. We are a trading people in Britain. It's in our blood to tear down barriers, to push new frontiers. Even with the weakness in the EU, Britain has become the jobs capital of the world, with a thousand jobs created every single day. 
our rate of economic growth is the envy of Europe. If this is what we can do with the EU in flames, imagine what we can do uh, when free to become a global trading nation once more. That's where the renewal will really kick in. Not tearing up ties, but building on them. Not being ruled by the EU, but being good neighbours to the EU. So this is my argument. The reality is that the EU needs to change. The changes I've outlined, I think, are reasonable and fair. But since they're not even being asked for, then British renewal outside the EU is now our best option. Staying in an unreformed, unyielding, uncompetitive EU will be the worst of all worlds. But before us, we have a win-win situation. Whether we negotiate an Italian new relation with the EU, like the one I described, or whether we chart our own course. What lies before us is a new British era of more freedom, more sovereignty, and more enterprise. This is a once in a generation chance. And what's clear now, as things currently stand, we should vote to leave. Thank you. Matthew, thank you very much indeed.